Very good. Okay, I, I'm gonna think we're gonna go ahead and kick it off. Um, again, my name is Steve Johns. Uh, I got roped in this because I've got a nice Zoom business Zoom account. So uh, uh, I am uh, more than happy to provide that. I'm a new board member for the Western Wildlife Corridor. Um, my family loves to be outdoors and the Western Wildlife Corridor helps make that happen for me and my uh, two teenage daughters and wife. Um, we're actually on the east side of town, but we've made it to be one of our uh, kind of um, uh, traditions to go out uh, Christmas Day after opening presents and stuff to go and hike Bender Mountain. And that's one of our premier uh, locations that is preserved along the Ohio uh, out near Sailor Park. Um, with that, I want to turn it over to Ariana Lambert. She's our staff member um, for us. Again, we're a pretty small nonprofit, um, and just recently we had been able to uh, um, be able to pay staff, and it's so helpful and useful to have Ariana along with us. Thanks so much, Ariana, and you're going to say a few words about the West Monolith Corridor. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Um, so hello, everyone. Welcome to Western Wildlife Quarters online event, Butterflies with Dr. Glenn. It's really great to see you all here. I, I wish I could see your faces, but I'm really, really happy you can make it. Um, we're just honestly so thrilled about this turnout. It was just really exciting. And plus, it's always great to share a passion. So that's also exciting. Um, like Steve said, my name is Ariana Lambert and I am the staff member at Western Wildlife Corridor. A few things before we get started. I'm gonna do a brief introduction and then our main speaker will talk for about 50 minutes. Throughout that time, we're gonna have your microphones muted, your guys' videos are gonna be off, but that's just to save the bandwidth so the video turns out really smooth for you all. So it's not that we don't wanna see you. We do, we do encourage you guys to type your questions in the chat box. So on the bottom of your screen, you guys should, here, let me make mine look the way yours would look. You guys should have, if you move your mouse on the very bottom, it'll say participants and then it'll say chat. And feel free to ask your questions in there during any time. And Steve's gonna monitor those throughout and sometimes Glenn will answer and then he'll answer at the very end as well for a Q&A session. Um, before we begin, so Western Wildlife Corridor is a mostly volunteer-run organization, like we've said. We've been protecting and restoring land since 1992, which is really wonderful. We protect land through ownership and setting up conservation easements. Our volunteers then go out and restore the preserves by clearing invasive species like emmer honeysuckle and garlic mustard. We have several preserves, but four of which are accessible to you guys and to the public. Um, you can go out and hike on our trails there. Just make sure you're being safe throughout the pandemic and practicing social distancing. For more information for WWC, we definitely encourage you to go to our website and follow us on Facebook. Um, we'll be sharing that at the very end of the presentation. But let's get started because I'm really excited. So today we'll be learning about butterfly defenses and to help us do that is Dr. Glenn Chrysler II, we met the first earlier, who has kindly offered to talk for us. Glenn is an assistant professor of chemistry at Mount St. Joseph University. He's been involved with entomology at Mississippi State University after locating two butterflies in Octopa County and later went to publish in the journal news of Lepidoptera Society respecting butterflies, which is really cool. Congratulations on that. Um, he's joined the National Butterfly Association Sorry, my cat is causing a lot of problems over here. Um, the National Butterfly Butterfly Association annual 4th of July count in Mississippi for the past four years. So I am a butterfly enthusiast. As you can probably tell, I have a lot more butterflies in my kitchen. So I'm very excited to hear Glenn talk. So without further ado, Glenn, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. Really appreciate it. Um, today, we're going to be talking about butterflies and butterfly defenses. When I was asked um, a couple of months ago if I would um, work with this particular project. Of course, I was really excited, but I was thinking, what would I, what, what's something that's not very commonly known? What's something that we don't think about when it comes to butterflies? And I really thought about their defenses because oftentimes we think about butterflies being very defenseless. They're very beautiful. They're very elegant. We like to see them. But, and of course, I'm assuming that if you're here, it's because you like butterflies. But I want you to know that you are not alone because. 
lots of other things like butterflies as well. It's not just us, right? We have birds that like butterflies. We have spiders, praying mantis, assassin bugs, lizards. Basically, they're, they're flying food, right? They're fast food. Um, we think about them being easy prey, very defenseless, but I'm going to show you in today's presentation how the butterflies are not as defenseless as we may assume them to be. So of these butterfly defenses, these are going to be the ones that we're going to be talking about today. Um, these include camouflage, confusion, startle, fright, poison, mimicry, and even speed. So these are going to be what we'll be talking about as far as defenses go. So first defense, camouflage. So we think about camouflage, um, when you think about military equipment, it's very commonly used, right? It's a concealment, it's a way that things are able to blend in and, and, and hide with the backdrop, right? So that's what camouflage refers to. So some butterflies or many butterflies utilize this exact same defense mechanism. So here are some examples of some butterflies using this camouflage defense mechanism. And in fact, I will give you guys a minute to look over some of, these, some of these and see if you can find the butterfly. So for instance, the Hackberry Emperor. Do you guys see the pair of Hackberry Emperors in that particular picture in the bottom left, in the bottom right? They're kind of hard to spot, right? But if you look, you can see them. So that blends in very well with the tree bark, of which is their substrate. Um, check out that goat wheat leaf wing. So if you look very closely, you might think that's just one, but that's actually two side by side, um, taking some sap off of this tree that was injured. Some, somehow this tree got injured and it was oozing sap and these goat wheat leaf wings were all over it. Um, the tawny emperor landed in that dead leaf. It, it really goes to show just how well these camouflage mechanisms work. And when I'm out in the field and I'm, and I'm looking for butterflies, oftentimes I don't see them initially. I go into habitat that I know to be where butterflies like. I'm walking around, I'm hoping to scare one up. And I'm hoping that it lands again somewhere where I'm able to get its picture. I don't see them until they take flight. So they camouflage very well. Well, that takes care of some butterflies. Um, there's another quote that I wanna, I wanna give you. This is by Ponce Dennis, uh, which is this. The butterfly is a flying flower the flower, a tethered butterfly. So that's not by accident. You might think that, they, that it is, but consider this. Some butterflies also camouflage with the flowers on which they nectar on. So we think about these really bright colors, they blend in very well with these flower petals. I wanna bring up one more thing in connection with this, which is when you think about a, a target, a target is hardest to catch when it's moving. So when a butterfly is in flight, that takes a little bit more to catch. But when it is landed and drinking nectar and when it's landed and, and resting, that is when it is at most at danger. So we might see these butterflies very easily in the air because they're very bright, splendid colors. But when they are landing on their flowers or in the greenery, they might be almost invisible. So here are several examples. Um, the cloudless sulfur, on this cross vine um, species on the far left is a really good example. That yellow is very similar to that yellow, that cross vine. Um, our southern dog face, the mating pair in the grass, that is a late summer um, form that we see. And the southern dog face in the, on the blanket flower, which is the red and yellow flower in the center, toward the center of our picture, um, you notice there's a different morph, and notice how well that really blends in with those flower petals. So once again, these are not easy to spot all out and about. You have to scare them up. So on this, if you look on the top left and the bottom right, I have two that are in gold, and those are the two butterflies that I was able to um, write a publication on with Terrence Cipher, which um, was from the Mississippi State University Entomology Museum. So these are the two butterfly species. So sometimes it pays off to look around, take pictures, document what you see. And so this is that paper that I was fortunate to work with Terrence with. Um, it was published in the News of Lepidopter Society. This butterfly, this large orange sulfur, which you see in the photograph 
um, for 9 24 16 so it's September 24 you see that I found that in Octavio High County and that is out well outside of its range butterflies are not always these flying creatures that we're accustomed to butterflies start off life as caterpillars if you take a look at this particular um, set of pictures, notice how these caterpillars blend in very well with the greenery. And so if you think finding butterflies are a little bit challenging, finding the caterpillars is even more challenging. Um, there's ways that we can do it. We can look for bite marks and leaves and then you start looking underneath the leaves. But even so, they're easy to miss because they blend in with their substrates very well. Um, so notice this cabbage white on the far left very green, looks very similar to its substrate. Um, this large orange sulfur caterpillar is yellow and black, which might be very striking and vivid, but on the partridge pea host plant that you see here, it is not very obvious at all. It would take quite a bit to spot it. So caterpillars use camouflage quite regularly. This is a very common defense mechanism for butterflies in all stages of their life. Also, butterflies undergo another process in their becoming a butterfly, which is the formation of a chrysalis. So a chrysalis, if you think about a butterfly being fast food, a chrysalis is like a protein shake. It's liquid on the inside and their only defense is that they stay hidden and not found by predators. So they camouflage very well. Look at how developed they are to, to just stay hidden. So the Eastern tiger swallowtail on the top um, looks very much like a piece, like a dead twig that is on that branch. We'll also see the sleepy orange, which looks like a green leaf. So they, it, it blends in very well with their substrates. And they, they, they have success because we, we see butterflies all the time, right? So this works. Another mechanism that butterflies use is confusion. So you think about confusion, you think about things that are ways that we're able to be confused, things that are, are thrown off, it's a bit indistinct, we don't know what we're looking at. And so you think about this working all the time with birds and things that, with, that are less intelligent, but this even works with people because we'll get into it, but here we have a slide that I'm gonna show you. We have two butterfly types that use this mechanism of confusion. We have our gossamer wing butterflies and we have our swallowtails. So it's kind of like, what am I looking at here? Here on the far left, we have a gray hair streak. I show people this picture all the time. Uh, and people always ask me that they look kind of strange, like, you know, like, what am I looking at? You know, I don't, I don't know, like, what is that? And of course, I'm like, it's a butterfly. But people are not able to see where the head is or the tails are. So if you guys were to take a minute, take a minute, answer to yourselves, of course, I'm not gonna hear you. But if you guys were to look at that gray hair streak, where would you assume the head is? Would the head be at A or would the head be where I have B? Take a look at your screen, see if you can figure it out. So what makes it really challenging is that these gossamer wing butterflies have hind wing projections. These hind wing projections look a lot like antenna. And some of them even have these false eye spots on their wings, which help to deceive predators. So in this case of our gray hair streak, our head is at the A location. If you look very closely, you can see its eyes and its real antenna at the location of A. B is actually just part of the wing. And what this does is that a predator that attacks, that makes the wrong move and attacks B instead of A, it will walk away with a little bit of wing and no butterfly because the butterfly can tear those wings and it will escape. They don't need most of their wings in order to fly. So this butterfly could still live a full life even without those hind wings or most of those hind wings. These butterflies also accentuate this, um, behave, this feature by their behavior. So here on the right, we have a juniper hair streak, which I'm gonna show you guys a video of. And I'm gonna show you how it grinds its wings in order to make those hind wing projections look even more lifelike and more like that would be antenna. So here is an example, okay?
Notice those hind wing projections in particular and how they move. Another thing I want you guys to have noticed is notice how that this butterfly tends to keep his hind wings above his head. He purposely pulls them up in order for the predator to assume that would be the place to attack. So this works quite well. Um, predators would attack the wrong end and then our butterfly is able to live to, to fight another day. These are our swallowtails, very beautiful butterflies. These are our classic butterflies. People tend to think about butterflies. People think about what, a monarch? Or they're thinking about swallowtail species. So swallowtail species, the reason they have those very highly developed tails on their wing is because that acts, once again, like false antenna. Um, that makes it a little bit diff more difficult for predators to tell where the head is and where the tail is. So for us, of course, take a look at our picture once again. We have a picture of a pipe vine swallowtail in both photographs, in this case, photograph and video. Um, notice A and notice B. Which one do you think is the actual head? If you were a predator, where would you attack or where should you attack? Would that be A or would that be B? All right, if you said B, that means that you picked the tails, the, the fake head, so you pick the tails. If you chose A, then you are correct, which I'm sure most of us did, because once again, these are our classic butterfly shapes. But these butterflies also have a couple other things up their sleeve. So for instance, one thing, when they fly, swallowtails in particular, they have these very highly dodgy flight patterns, right? So think about it, if you're running from a person, um, you know, hopefully none of us encounter this situation, but if we're trying to outrun gunshots, they tell you what? In, in the movies. They tell you to run in a zigzag, right? And that's what these butterflies do. They fly side to side to side to side. Um, the tails draw attention away from the body. And notice in this video what this butterfly does in order to maximize this illusion, okay? So I'm gonna show you guys a video. Pay attention. All right, we're having a couple of glitches. Let's try that one more time. I'm gonna do it one more time just for good measure. I'm not certain that we were able to really see it. Well, that's best we're gonna get. <laughs> but um, if, you, if you look at the, the swallowtail, this, this pipe vine swallowtail, the hind wings were kept fairly still, whereas the top wings were moving, and his head is very small. His body is actually very small in comparison to these wings. And so once again, the predator would assume, falsely, most likely, that those tails would be the head. That would be the butterfly's face. So here's a list of several butterflies in these two families, or in these two um, genre of butterflies, uh, that that utilize this particular mechanism. So we have our swallowtails and we have our gossamer wing butterflies. So um, fun fact, if you guys live in the southern eastern United States, there's the great purple hair streak, which is out like now. They'll be out during the fall as well, the early parts of fall. They feed on mistletoe. So very interesting butterfly to find. They're one of my favorites to see. But we unfortunately in Ohio don't have those. But we have plenty others. Caterpillars use a very similar style of defense as well. So if you look at this monarch caterpillar, look at it. So if I were to ask you guys a question, once again, where's the head? Is the head at A or is the head at B? Where would you assume this caterpillar's head would be? I'm going to, as before, give you guys a few minutes or a a little bit to a little bit of time to 
figure it out. So where do you think this caterpillar's head would be? Would it be at A or would it be at B? All right. In this case, the caterpillar's head is actually at B. Um, if you look very closely past the actual, you know, antenna extensions on B, notice you will see the caterpillar, the caterpillar's eyes. The eyes have stripes on them, so his eyes are actually striped. So it really makes it hard to tell it heads from tails. Now, you might think, now why is that important? Because the caterpillar can't live without part of its body. You can't just snap a caterpillar in half and then have a living caterpillar after that, right? So what caterpillars are able to do is if they get approached by perhaps a wasp or maybe in some cases a bird, if they have a chance to know that they're being um, preyed upon, they could drop completely off of the leaf, off of the branch and fall to the ground without being hurt. And perhaps if they fall through some leaf litter, they fall, far enough through something that makes it difficult to get to them, they could survive. That would be their chance of survival. So once again, it sounds like a very split second, but in the wild, if you're in nature, a split second can mean the difference quite literally in life and death. And of course, this mechanism works. Um, I'll show you guys lots of really nice pictures in this presentation. I, wanna, I want you guys to, to know that the reality is most of the butterflies that I come across are not this type of picture worthy. Most of them are tattered wings. Most of them are old. They're not always beautiful as, as they are when they're freshly emerged. Um, and typically, I don't save the pictures, but when I was putting this together, I went back and I dug through my, my SD cards and I found a few that I have taken pictures of. And so in this case, both of these are tiger swallowtails. Um, but, and they're both missing a piece of the hind wing. So this really goes to show you just how effective this mechanism of deception is, of confusion. So birds, in, this, in both cases, we can assume, have attacked both of these tiger swallowtails in the exact same location, in the exact same way, and we have the exact same pattern of, of um, interference with butterflies' wings. They're still fine. You don't feel too sorry for them. This is what they're made to do. <laughs> They're made to survive, so it works. And this is mostly how you find butterflies in nature. You find them missing pieces of wings because they've survived. Another mechanism of defense involves startling. So when you think about something that is startling, you think about something that's kind of like a jump scare, right? It's not that you're afraid for your life, but you are a little bit, you know, like a jump scare right? Like a mild shock. Did anybody jump from that? Anybody? How about that? <laughs> so that would be considered a jump scare. You're not scared for your life, but it is something that makes you take a step back for a hot second, right? So butterflies use this all the time. So the way it works is that you have a butterfly that looks very different on the outside of the wings versus the inside of the wings. This is how that works. So if you look, look at these butterflies on the left, these are, these are the wings closed or our lateral view of our butterflies. They're very drab. They blend in very well with the surroundings, the, the dead bark, the tree leaf, you know, whatever. They're, they're very just drab, right? But all of a sudden, they open their wings up very quickly. And when they do that, if, they're, if they feel threatened, they open their wings up you have a bright flash of color, and that makes you take a, a double take. This is enough time for them to make a getaway. Um, and if you think it doesn't work, um, of course, most of us are probably not afraid of moths, but if, have you ever walked by a doorway and had a moth fly out suddenly in your face? And did you take a step back? Well, that would be an example of how startling would work. That would be enough time for that insect to get away in theory. So here I gave you guys three examples. We have a red admiral, um, a American lady. You guys might be familiar with the painted lady. There are different species. Um, we kind of just kind of found it out relatively recently from a scientific perspective. Um, but they're very similar. And you have a question mark butterfly. That's actually his name. It's not that I don't know what it is. It's actually called a question mark. And that's how they, they're, they're very 
pretty on the inside, but with their wings closed, they look very much like leaves. So now this brings us to our next offense, which we talked about startling, not being afraid for your life is just a jump scare. Fright, on the other hand, is a fear of danger. It's a fear of something that could be about to happen to you, right? When you think about survival, uh, survival of the fittest, you think about having to be able to survive potential attacks. You have to have mechanisms in place where you can instinctively find danger. And animals and humans alike, we are all programmed to find faces. It is very instinctual. Has anybody stared at the ceiling and, and just and found faces or looked at a brick wall if you're just staring at it and, and seeing some type of somehow a, a, a face appears? It's very instinctual. So if I showed you this slide with several pictures on it, um, none of these are faces, obviously, right? What do you see? What is the first thing that you see? Right? Do we see faces? So this is a very good example of how we are programmed to see faces. Even that sandwich, which is obviously a sandwich, the first thing that you most likely saw was a, was a face with the tongue sticking out. It's what we do. So if you turn the lights out and you see something like that, you might have a cause for concern. Well, butterflies capitalize on this and use this for their defense. So, here are several butterflies utilizing fright as a defense. So you think about birds being butterfly predators, but also think about other insects. So think about things like your praying mantis um, that might want to attack a butterfly or a uh, assassin bug. So as they're approaching and they come across all these eyes, you know, suddenly this insect feels like it might be in danger because remember, for the most part, butterfly predators are not at the top of the food chain. So if you are an assassin bug, you might get eaten by a bird. If you are a bird, you could get eaten by an owl, right? So these butterflies are able to give them a second thought before, or cause them to have a second thought before they would go in for the, for the kill, so to speak. So here are several examples. We have our owl, which Look at our American lady and compare that with our owl. Same thing with our buckeye. Very big eyes, you know, owl-like in, in nature. Um, if you look over at our wood nymph, look at all of those eyes and also our little wood satyr. Several eyes, our southern pearly eye. Several eyes, this allows it to, once again, it looks like you have, you're, you're being surrounded. So once again, a predator has a second thought before it goes in for the attack and maybe it won't actually go in for the attack at all because it feels like its life is in danger so this is another one of the butterflies main defenses caterpillars use this defense as well so in red here i have outlined in red i have an actual snake okay so that's a real snake you know but all of these other pictures are actually caterpillars okay if you look at our, and, and most, by the way, I'm going to kind of throw in a, a, gener, a gener, generality in here too. Most of these are swallowtail species caterpillars. They are able to rear up with their head as if that would be, they're a snake and stick out and project, which is called an osmium. That, this osmium has a very foul smell. It's a chem, it has a chemical in it that should deter predators, but also it resembles a snake's tongue. I want to point out one more thing. These big eye markings that you see on this caterpillar, those are not actual eyes. Those are just face paint, so to speak. That's just the designs on the caterpillar's body. The actual eyes are very, very small. And in fact, if you look at this second picture of this, um, that would be a spice bush swallowtail. Um, if you look in the, in the front of the caterpillar, top middle, in front of the caterpillar, the clear looking front, you can see the, this caterpillar's actual eyes. So it looks a lot less intimidating when you know exactly what you're looking at, but people just alike look at these caterpillars, get very afraid. They say, you know, I saw a snake on my, you know, on my tree outside. And it actually is not a snake. So if you can see that people get afraid or, 
or or are apprehensive after seeing these caterpillars. Imagine what a bird would do that tries to attack this caterpillar and it raises up and, and makes this snake like appearance. So that's a defense and it works. Another defense that butterflies use is poison. All right. So now when I talk about poison, we're talking about something that is toxic that can cause injury or sickness when it is ingested. And whenever I tell people that butterflies, some butterflies are poisonous, people always look at me and say, I never knew that butterflies bit, right? And this brings me to this particular slide. I want to introduce a fact, if you're not introduced to it already, is that venomous and poisonous are two totally different things. They're not the same, okay? So when I say venom, I'm talking about the toxins being injected. So that's the method of action for a venom. The, the poison has to actually go into the object or into the person, all right? So in this case, we have a snake. The snake is venomous. He bites. By the way, that's a timber rattler in case you guys are curious. Uh, that's a long story. We won't go into that story today. On the right, we have an apple that apparently is poisoned, and this lady is eating it. Well, if she eats it, she's ingesting the toxins, which makes that apple poisonous. So there's a difference. Butterflies do not bite. So these are several, these are some of the more common Eastern U.S. butterflies that actually utilize this mechanism of poison. We have the Gulf Fritillary, the Pipe Vine Swallowtail, the Monarch, now, I took the pipe vine swallowtail from two different views. So we have a dorsal view as well as a lateral view of the pipe vine in this particular slide. But how do they become poisonous? Let's talk about it. It comes from the host plant for the caterpillars. Butterflies are very selective when they pick which plant they want to lay their eggs on. So they lay their eggs on plants, on very specific families of plants. So the Gulf Fritillary only flowers in the passion vine or passion flower species bracket okay that's what they're looking for pipe vine swallowtails will lay their eggs on things of the aristocratic family and which um, those are a lot of times those are your pipe vines so that's how it got its name pipe vine swallowtail very creative right so pipe vine species of pipe vine swallowtail um the monarch lays its eggs on milkweed species and these plants all have very specific and specialized chemical agents that are meant to deter predators from eating them. But these caterpillars are able to somewhat hijack those mechanisms and incorporate the toxins from these plants into their bodies and use it to poison anything that would eat either that caterpillar or the adult butterfly. Um, this is where I'll bring up a very um, highly possibly controversial topic, but I'm going to do it anyway because this is what I do as a scientist, which is People are on this bandwagon of all natural, all natural. Well, guess what? Passion flowers on this top left contain cyanide. And cyanide is a, to is a very highly effective um, toxin that stops your body from using oxygen. We all know what cyanide is, and it's a very natural product. Nobody has to synthesize it. This plant makes cyanide by itself. It is a natural product. So just because something is all natural, does not make it okay or good to use. So keep that in mind <laughs> um, when you look at your, in your pill cabinet or when you're making decisions. Um, so Gulf Fritillaries have cyanide in them. This is what they're able to use to deter attack. Um, next, we have this pipe vine species, these pipe vine um, swallowtails or pipe vine species, which contain this aristocratic acids. These are bad news. They cause cancer, they're bitter, they cause vomiting, they cause diarrhea. And so anybody that gets a hold of a pipe vine swallowtail thinking that would be good food is in for a rude awakening. Uh, monarchs uh, contain cardiac glycosides from the milkweed that they eat, and these cause heart attack. They increase the blood flow to your heart so much so that the volume expands and your heart can't cope with it, and the pumping is not effective enough in order to continue, and then you have a heart attack. So. Once again, these are all natural things. Nobody added this. All nature made, very toxic. These butterflies are able to hijack this chemical warfare from the plants and use it to their advantage. 
Another defense that some butterflies use is mimicry. So, you know, why do I have to study for a test when I can just copy my neighbor's test who actually studied for the test, right? So that's kind of the way some mimicry works. So we have two types of mimicry that we're gonna be talking about in this presentation. We have Batesian mimicry and we have Malarian mimicry. So um, butterflies that copy one another, other animals use the same type of mechanism, but we're gonna talk about these two in particular with relationship to butterflies. So Batesian mimicry is mimicry where we have an edible animal which is protected by resemblance to one that is noxious or one that is poisonous. So if you look in this particular diagram that I put together, this is the black butterfly circle of the eastern US. There are a few more that we can add to this um, list. We have the female Diana fritillary, which is a protected species. I do not yet have a picture of it. It's, it's very hard to find. And also we have the Palamedes swallowtail, which we find further south USA. Um, Mississippi has them also. Um, there's a very interesting reason that we don't have them, which is because of the ash borer, which has killed much of the um, sweet bay magnolia trees, which is their host plant. So otherwise they would be found a lot more in the eastern US. But they all fall under that umbrella. So this is Batesian mimicry because these other butterflies that are outlined in gray, these butterflies are not harmful. And I'm gonna challenge you guys to take a look. I'm gonna give, give it a, maybe a, a solid 30 seconds. Take a look at this slide and see if you can distinguish the differences between these butterfly species, because it's not easy. So as you're looking, if you're having a hard time picking out the differences, right? Then imagine a bird. Something that's very in important to note too is that with mimicry, you have a bit of sacrifice that has to occur, right? Some of these poisonous butterflies have to get killed and eaten in order for the birds or the predators to realize that they're not good eating, right? This has to happen. And then when that does happen, Think about all the other butterflies that benefit from that one butterfly sacrifice of its life, right? So that would be how that works. But also, we already talked about a defense mechanism for these swallowtails, being that they have these false tails, birds would attack the tail. And in the case of this pipe vine swallowtail, it is so toxic that a bird, even getting a clip of the wing in its mouth, would become ill. It would get food poisoning, so to speak, just from a piece of the wing getting in its beak this would make it remember not to eat any of these others. So that sacrifice percentage can go down a little bit, but some butterflies will, become, will be attacked. Another thing to note is that this Batesian mimicry works best when you have a very high abundance of these, um, the toxic species. So if the toxic species is the most common in the area, you will have more of these other forms of these, butter, of these other butterflies which are not toxic. If you have less of them, that defense is not as reliable. It is not as effective. There is less, quote unquote, herd immunity. And so you have these other butterflies which are in more danger as a result. Another more famous example of um, two butterflies that mimic each other is the monarch and the viceroy. And I've, I've kind of timed myself, we're at like 35 minutes of, me, of my talking. And this is the first time, other than showing you guys that slide of the poison, that we're about to really start talking about monarchs. I think people oftentimes think about butterflies, and they only think of monarchs, and they think that all butterflies are monarchs. And that is simply not true. I think you've seen from this presentation that there are many species of butterflies. But if you look here at this monarch, we already know it's poisonous. The viceroy is not. Um, a predator would be perfectly fine to eat this viceroy. It's perfectly safe to eat, but the monarch is not. But what are the differences? Now I'm going to point them out to you. If, you. if you take a look at the butterfly on the left, um, unfortunately, I'm not able to give you guys a pointer with the zoom view, but if you look in the center of that hind wing, if you look very closely on the monarch, the hind wing, the bottom wing, you will see a, what looks like a mitten almost, okay? That mitten is one way we can determine that is a monarch. Now look on the butterfly on the right, the viceroy, we don't have the mitten. On the monarch, all the veins come out from the body. They're going 
from where the body is, they're going outwards to the out of the wing, right? They're going outwards. On the viceroy, the butterfly on the right, on the front wing and the hind wing, but look, you will see a vein that is perpendicular to the intersects that goes across all of those parallel veins. So that would be our indicator for our viceroy. That's how we determine the species right there. That's our identifiers. Once again, this takes practice for a person to learn. Do you think a bird would be able to pick this, these differences out? So that's a more famous example, and we see that it does work in nature. Which brings us to our second type of mimicry. I remember I was talking about how that there is some sacrifice involved in the success of this mimicry. Um, if you look here at this particular example, we have um, the monarch, the soldier, and the queen butterfly. These are all milkweed butterflies, by the way, because they all feed on milkweed. They all contain the same type of toxins. They are all very, you know, they're, they're all toxic, all three of them, but they look alike. And what this does is that if a predator learns to avoid the monarch, it also knows to avoid the soldier as well as the queen because they look very similar. It's not gonna attack any of those three. No matter who it attacks first, the bird, it would learn quickly not to do that again. And it would protect not one, but all three. If each of these butterflies had a, had a different look or a different appearance independent of each other, then it would require a sacrifice of all three species individually in order to, to produce that uh, avoidance. But because they all look alike, avoidance of one or protection for one equals protection for all three of our species in this particular case. So um, the soldier and queen, I will also mention, southern, eastern United States, these butterflies in this presentation are all from the eastern USA. Um, the queen and soldier are further south, um, and that's, that's where you can find them. We unfortunately do not have them in Ohio. The caterpillars for the milkweed butterflies even utilize the exact same, this similar um, mimicry as well, this malaria mimicry. Take a look at the monarch caterpillar as well as the soldier and queen uh, caterpillars. Very similar. Once again, it establishes that less um, sacrifice needed in order to protect the species, which is very good for the species, for all three species. It's good for all of them. So this is where I point out some of the very fine differences that you can find in these butterflies if you look. Um, and also at the end of the presentation, I will actually share with you guys a link if you would like where you guys will have access to this field guide. I'm actually potentially working on creating a field guide for some of my photos on um, butterflies and distinguishing them out in the field. Um, I don't know when, when or if that's gonna take full effect, but I do have a couple of pages together and I will share with you guys this page and one more, um, which helps us, helps you learn the differences between the, the two. Because oftentimes we see um, these swallowtails, people say, oh, I saw a swallowtail. Um, but which type? There's several types. And of course, these are just the black butterflies. And people that, say, that see swallowtails that are black in color oftentimes assume, oh, I saw a black swallowtail the other day because it was the color of it was black. But that is not true either because there are several. So this is a field guide view of how you can determine the differences between these butterflies. Well, and we, we've got our first question. All right. Uh, maybe if you go back a slide, if that's possible. Um, there's a question from Colleen out there that, is there any genetic evidence to show that the monarch, soldier, and queen all evolved from a common ancestor, which I'm might, not, I am might not explain the similar mimicry and toxicities? Well, it, well, what I'll say about it is this. I think that when you look at, at these particular sets, it seems as if there's a similarity. Um, I, I can't comment on that particular statement. I don't, I'm, I'm not the one to comment on that particular statement. I'm, I'm a chemist. I am not an entomologist, <laughs> unfortunately. But once again, there are certain similarities. We have, they're all feeding on milkweed. They all have that very similar um, toxicity. So other than that, as far as I can, I'll, I'll, I'm going to comment. No, no worries. Thank you. All right. 
So once again, here's our monarch, um, our monarch versus viceroy butterfly. If you look, once again, you can see the mitten, whether the wing is open or the wing is closed. Um, you can notice that we have this particular mitten that you can see. The veins all, once again, they radiate outwards. On the viceroy, notice this perpendicular vein that, that runs across. Whether you're looking at the lateral or the dorsal views, you will see this perpendicular vein. And of course, if all else fails, nothing beats a good escape, right? You got to be able to get out with all swiftness. So these butterflies I'm featuring here, of course, all butterflies are somewhat speedy and able to fly away. But these butterflies are really built for it, right? So look at these skippers. These are all skipper family butterflies. People oftentimes mistake these as um, moths. But if you look at these, um, any of these, notice how they're, they're built. And I put in the middle of the slide, notice the jet. So the spider jet in the middle, very aerodynamic, very specialized to, to take flight and you know, very quick accelerations and all this. And, but, and look, at, look at our butterfly, our satchel skipper, the bottom center. Um, you notice that his wings, this, is, this butterfly is actually a little bit, you know, concerned because I was taking this picture with my iPhone. Um, I had a 5S, so I was taking this picture with that. And I, I got fairly close. He didn't fly away yet, but he was concerned and he was ready to take off. And look at his takeoff stance and compare that with that jet. So these butterflies in general, skippers, can fly 30 miles an hour. Um, oftentimes, if you're out in the field and you're, you're walking by where these skippers can be found, you'll hear them whirring past your ear. They're very quick and, and, they're, and they're very speedy and you'll see them just stop very suddenly. That's, this is what they do. So they're very fast. Um, here, are our, here are some skippers I'll, I'm showing on this particular slide. And uh, these are all found here in Ohio, by the way, with the exception of the long-tailed skipper. And the peck skipper, I did take a photo of here in Ohio since I've, since I've been here. So this kind of brings us to kind of some of, you know, a few um, interesting things to think about. So one thing being, did you know that there are 49 species of butterflies that can be found in Ohio and that there are 750 species in the United States and over 17,500 worldwide? So if you're curious, you want to find out more about butterflies in your particular county of where you live, wherever you are, you can go to the Bomona webpage, which stands for Butterflies and Moths of North America. You can click on your state, you can click on your county, and you can get a county checklist of all butterflies and or moths, if you're interested, and they have been documented in your county. Uh, Western Wildlife Corridor has a very diverse habitat where we can find many butterfly species, which is very nice, which is uh, why I'm very excited to be able to speak at this particular event. A few things extra I wanna kinda introduce couple of common questions that I, that I get talking to people. People always want to know, well, what's the difference in a butterfly and a moth? What's the difference, right? How do I know the difference? Well, they're both Lepidoptera. And that's their order, which means wings with scales. And think about it, butterflies and moths have those scaly wings. But the difference is that butterflies have club antenna. So if you look at this um, um, picture, this, this picture I'm showing, this graphic here, that's what I'm looking for, the graphic. Look at our butterfly in the top. Look at how his antennas have that club shape to the ending. Um, if you look at the moths, though, on the other hand, beneath it, you have two different antenna types. And so this can be dimorphism, which could be maybe differences in um, our species, differences in male and female. And it could be a matter of um, just different moth species in general. But notice that this very furry antenna, that's one example of a moth. And also just a straight antenna with no club at all. That's also a moth. Um, the bottom moth, um, oftentimes the male have that very feathery antenna that increases the surface area of the, our antenna, which lets this moth actually pick up single molecules of pheromones from females, and they can track um, another moth in the dark, potentially, where there's, no, where there's very little light. They can find each other miles and miles away from each other. So that is why that is. People tend to think also, which is somewhat true, that butterflies land with wings held up, moths with wings open. That's true a lot of times, 
sometimes butterflies do open their wings up in order to sun and, and, and gather, you know, when it's cooler weather or when they're in the shade, they tend to open their wings up sometimes. So you can't always go by that either. They're just exceptions all the way around. But what you want to look for, if you have a chance, would be the antenna. And I want to kind of take a second to break a myth, which is that butterflies are colorful and moths are just very drab. So I have on the slide, I have six different pictures of butterflies or moths or of our Lepidoptera. And I want you guys to take a second and think butterfly or moth, okay? For the first one. First picture, butterfly or moth, what do you think? Say it out loud to yourself or out loud to your, whoever's at home with you, whoever you're quarantining with, all right? What do you think? It's actually a moth. What about number two? Butterfly or moth? Say it out loud. Yeah? It's a moth. I think we all know that one's a Luna moth, very famous. What about number three? What do you think? It's actually a moth. N number four. is a butterfly. Now you might look at that and say, you know, hang on one second, wait a second. How is that a butterfly? That looks like a moth to me. Take a look at his antenna. See those clubs on the tip of his antenna? That's how we know he's a butterfly. What about number five? That is a butterfly. And number six. It's a butterfly, I mean, it's a, butterfly. It's a moth, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, so we've broken the myth. These moths are very beautiful if you look at some of these pictures of these moths. And some of these butterflies are not as colorful as others. So you really, you have to look at those antenna. That's gonna be your determining factor of whether or not you're looking at a butterfly or if you are looking at a moth. One more thing I wanna talk about as, as I kind of close things out, which is kind of like why, you know, why you should care about butterflies and what we can do to help protect them ourselves. We are, living in a time where this planet is in a crisis. There is urban development going on. There is climate change. Um, there is abundant pesticide usage. Um, there is law, illegal logging. There is legal just clear cutting. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of things that are disrupting our ecological balances, um, which equals a less biodiverse habitat for all animals. Um, you look at this very top picture. I think this was a very powerful graphic when I found it. I thought it was this very, just, it, it spoke, I thought it just spoke into existence what we're seeing. If you talk to somebody who's, who goes back, you know, maybe 50 years, 60 years, they say, you know, I used to see all the time X, Y, and Z. I saw butterflies all the time growing up as a kid, but now I don't find them very much anymore. And that is because of the above reason that we've talked about. You think about birds, you know, um, people, I think people who look into birds are more popular, but people that look into birds, like, you know, I'm not able to find these birds in as many of locations. And it has to do with because we're kind of somewhat entering what we call, I know, their silent spring. A silent spring refers to where you have less birds and you have less birds singing, less birds singing out, which refers to a silence. So that's because we have less bird food. We're living in a time where the monarch migration could cease by the end of the century. This is all very devastating news. And I want to talk a little bit about the monarch migration, which kind of, and, and why we should really care. Monarchs in the, in the fall of the year, they all centralize down, with the exception of our Western monarchs, which we're not including them. They all go down to Central America and Mexico, the very specific forest, um, and they huddle together all winter. They don't eat, they do not eat food at all the entire winter. They, res they rely on their fat reserve that they have been able to uh, put together over their lifetime. And so they have to have plenty of food to eat, especially during the fall of the year, because they have to come together and survive all winter off of what they ate during the fall. But we spray our roadsides unnecessarily. Why do we need to spray roadsides? I don't know. We cut, we have these very immaculate lawns that we cut. We have large lawns and we keep them maintained to a T. And so what happens is that these butterflies don't have, they simply don't have enough fat reserve to survive during the winter and they starve. This is a picture of the ground beneath some of these trees in the, in the winter at Mex in Mexico. 
and this just shows these butterflies that have just, they're, they're out. They're, they're out of food. They're, they're dead. They're going to die. And this is partly what is cutting down on our butterfly numbers. And it, these are all things that we can do something about. So what can you do? You can plant native plants. You can plant caterpillar host plants and nectar plants. Um, if you would allow it, uh, maybe even plant some fall blooming plants and maybe even milkweed for the monarchs. Allow certain areas of your lawn to become pollinator habitat. Think about it. How often are you in your yard, except, and I'm not including when you're out maintaining and cutting it and weed eating, how often are you in your, in your lawn? Well, the odds are that you're probably not outside of your lawn very often at all. And according to NASA, there are 40 million acres of lawn in the lower 48 states, and that's 40 million acres of land and food stolen from our pollinators. So if we can, can do it, maybe we can make some of our lawn pollinator habitat. As you choose to do that, as you do that, start documenting your sightings with our naturalists. You can see lots of different things. If you plant things, things will come. And so you might end up actually finding new species. Consider keeping the outside of your house dark at night. Um, that's very essential for some insects to communicate with each other. For instance, fireflies, they need the dark in order to find one another. If, it might seem very small, the difference that you make with your yard. But if everybody cooperated with this, it makes a huge difference. So when I talk about native landscaping, this is what most people think about. They're thinking about what I call lazy. It's lazy lawn maintenance. That's horrible. This is not um, native landscaping. And then many people wonder, what will my homeowners association think about me? Right? But this is the actuality of what native landscaping can look like. You have low maintenance lawns. You can save money and water. You don't need pesticides. And you can be an environmental steward. And you will actually be the envy of your neighbors. So consider it, think about it. Um, that's something that we can all potentially do with our, with our yards when we do our landscaping. We can, consider, we can consider landscaping using native plants. So I want to close this whole talk out with two quotes. I like quotes. The first one is by Aristotle, which says, there is something of the marvelous in all things of nature. And during this quarantine time that we're all kind of shut in the house and we're all wearing masks and we're all, you know, afraid to even go to the grocery store, it is safe to go outdoors and go outside, very, very relatively low risk of contracting anything. And so during this time, I think this is very relevant. Um, Mary Oliver's Instructions for Living a Life. She says, pay attention be astonished and tell about it. So go outside, find different discoveries, and, and, and I look forward to hearing your reports about it at some point in the future. So thank you so much, everybody, uh, Western Wildlife Corridor, Mount St. Joseph University, people who have provided me photos, whether that's Bruce and Sally and Kieran. Um, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Um, also, quick shout out to the Entomology Museum, where I learned a lot of what I have. Um, these are the, um, Dr. Guyton in the top left we have dr richard brown and on the bottom right we have terrence which is who i co-wrote the publication with and of course if i give mississippi state a slide i have to also acknowledge mount st joseph university and i want to open the floor to any kind of question that you guys might have great thank you so much glenn that was awesome and your timing of course is impeccable uh, perfect uh you're getting a lot of great comments in the chat already there were a couple questions one was uh the first one was can butterflies regrow their wings? They actually do not. They, um, they don't live very long typically. And so, you know, so most butterflies live on the order of maybe at most a month. Um, there are a few butterflies which, you know, overwinter. So of course the monarch fall brood in particular can live the entire winter. It lives several months. Um, there's the morning cloak, which is known to live 11 months. Um, that's the longest living, you know, as far as, you know, pretty longest living documented species of butterfly that we have. But long story short, no, they cannot regrow, regrow their wings once they're clipped or once they're damaged. That's kind of it. So unfortunately. All right. Number two was, are moths nocturnal? All moths are not nocturnal. So we, once again, moths are very complex. And I'll, I'll kind of back up for a second and say this. When you think about butterflies and moths, uh, they are of the same order which means that they're somewhat related. So you have your 
butterflies and moths, which are all Lepidoptera. And there's so many phyla of moths. That, and that's, you know, maybe if you're not scientific as much, that's just, it's a grouping. So that's a bigger group. So there's, there's lots of several subgroups when you talk about moths. Butterflies are all monophyletic, which means they're all of that same phylum. So what that kind of brings us to is that, they're that moths are very diverse. And the different diversity of moths means that they're, you can't make these generalities. So you can't say that they're all nocturnal, although a lot of them are. You have diurnal, diurnal moths, which fly during the day. Um, some moths cannot eat once they are adults. They are absolutely, that's it. But then some moths are very extremely so, they're pollinators. Some plants are specialized for pollination from very specific moths. Certain orchids only get pollinated by certain hawk moths. So it's very hard to make this kind of, these kind of generalities when it comes to moths. And so in that case, the answer is no, all moths are not, not, are not nocturnal. Great. Is there a relatively easy way to tell if a butterfly is male or female? It's going to depend on your species. Um, so tiger swallowtail, which I, I'll kind of back up to that slide. I'm going to do quite a bit of backing up. Um, but while I'm going there, I'll bring up that some butterflies do have extreme forms of dimorphism, which is how we can tell male versus female. Um, but others, not so much. So let's see. One second. I'll give you guys a very there's, oh, perfect. OK. Extreme example. Ah, uh, I'm going too fast to see. Yeah, there's a little delay. In oh, the well, there is a delay. Let's see. Okay, hang on. We'll do it like this. And maybe exit. Or at least I think I will. Exit the PowerPoint and just click on the slide. Okay, here we go. All right. So when you look at this particular slide here, so are you, are, are everybody able to still see that slide? That I have small up there? Tail slide? Yes, perfect, okay. So if you look at that, that's actually a male, and a male on the right, female on the left. On the right, um, sometimes, in this case, the male always will be yellow for a tiger swallowtail, always. The female can be more complex because you can't have a female which is yellow and you can't have a female which is black. Um, so that's one way in this case, being this is a tiger swallowtail, we automatically know with her being dark phase that this is definitely a female. Um, other butterflies, you have to look for more, you know, very small details, so, such as, you know, maybe a dot on the wing with the case with the, with the monarch, there's a particular spot that we can, we can determine. So not always, it's gonna be species to species dependent, unless you're looking specifically at the pubic region on your butterfly, then, you know, of course, you would have to have a really good camera in order to, to actually see that. So typically, no. There's been some on the uh, question on the climate of butterflies. Do they like sunny places? Can they live in the desert? They do live in the desert, too. Yeah, they, they like sun. They like humidity. Um, but they, once again, they're, they're very highly effective at um, surviving, survival. I was just reading an article not too long ago, actually, showing how that these butterflies are able to regulate their body temperatures. And so they're in the extreme heats, they're able to minimize their um, shadow. So that kind of lets us see how much sunlight is actually hitting their wings. So if they're really hot, they'll hold their wings up and they'll be able to turn themselves to certain angles where they're able to have less sunlight directly hitting them, which keeps them cooler. And plus their wings being the size that they are, that's, that's great for thermal conduction, right? We're able to re remove some of the heat from that butterfly with the long wings. That's a good thing for heat transfer. Um, and so, yeah, they, they, do really, they do okay in those type of environments. In fact, Arizona, um, there's different parts of Arizona, but that has the most butterfly species of any state in the U.S. So, and so and part of that is desert. Hmm, interesting. Um, so then there's been some comments on the types of plants to attract certain butterflies. So somebody commented that their zinnias seem to attract the red admirals. Um, oh, that's very nice. Um, oftentimes I see red admirals, um, they like salt and they like, you know, things that are dead and decaying. But they do occasionally like flowers. So zinnias are a really good um, nectar plant. They're not native to the eastern U.S., unfortunately. But you don't have to plant all native. Um, zinnias are great. But also consider maybe things such as, and I'll go back to that slide, some of the liatris species, 
um, maybe even some sunflower. If you have an area that you are able to get away with it, maybe even allow some golden rot to grow, you know, sunflowers, things, things along, those, along those lines are all great plants for it. Um, what I would recommend that you do is that you would go to who, whatever state you're in, is that I would, I would find the extension service um, for that state and I would ask them which plants um, they would recommend because they're gonna have several depending on your soil, your elevation, all that, that they would recommend that you plant for butterflies. Great, here's a cool one. Uh, what butterflies or moths do you have on your bucket list? <laughs> I have several. So one in particular is a little metal mark. So hopefully next summer I'll get to go to Mississippi and, and find that one. They're, the Diana Fritillary, I've actually, I know where they are. I want to get a picture. So that's on my bucket list as well. I have, I have several. It's, it's too long. I, I can't keep talking. We'll be talking all day. <laughs> uh, and uh, maybe we'll just wrap it up on that because uh, there are a couple of, of specific questions that maybe we can get back to as we look at the chat. All right. I want to I do one more thing if that's okay. Sure. Uh, okay. So I have, this is a link I was promising. If you guys want to take a picture of that or scan that, that takes you to, I've created a a Google Photos album that you guys have access to now. And it has in it the field guide, the two field guides that I put together, as well as my contact information. So if you guys um, would like me to speak at an event that you have coming up, you guys can contact me that way um, and we can talk about it. So, or any kind of success stories, I look forward to hearing from you in the future. So thank you so much. Great, Glenn. Thank you again. Uh, I'm going to try to throw up our quick other slide that we have and thank people again for coming. Thank you, Ariana, for so much for setting this up. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about the Western Wildlife Corridor, uh, we of course have a Facebook page and here's that information. And um, I think that was just an inspiring talk. Glenn, you really know your stuff as a chemist. <laughs> this isn't your day job, but uh, somehow you um, have uh, such an interest in this, and, and I love that passion, and it shows through uh, in this kind of presentation. We did have over 100 folks uh, actually uh, attend the talk, so that was uh, super special, and I think we did, for the most part, get through everything, but maybe the videos. The videos we might have to work out, and uh, next time we're gonna maybe add uh, a poll function where people can ask, answer those questions of, is it A or B? I think uh, there is that utility in the, uh, the Zoom call. But uh, it was so nice to meet you virtually. Ariana, thank you again for organizing this and, and piecing it together. So good to see some familiar faces out there, our names on the call. And uh, I think with that, we're, we'll wrap things up. Ariana, anything else on your end? I think it's important to know that they have been recording this event, so we will be sharing a link to that recording. And um, I tried to copy all the questions I could, and just in case you guys do want those, I can send them to Glenn, or just if you guys know the answers, you can help each other out, be a community. So um, yeah, thank you so much. This was wonderful. I love seeing all of you, Glenn. Absolutely great. And pictures were stunning, very beautiful. Awesome job. Thanks again for everyone for attending and, uh, you know, help us out to make sure this happens again. Go out and look for some butterflies in your yard, plant a couple of flowers for them to feed off of. It's, it's the right thing to do. Thanks again. Thanks.